Oklahoma Gardening is a production of the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the land-grant mission of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University, dedicated to improving the quality of life of the citizens of Oklahoma through research-based information. Underwriting assistance for our program is provided by the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping to keep Oklahoma green and growing. Today, the best of Oklahoma gardening is chock full of projects for the coming season. Host Casey Hinches plants a fun salsa garden in a container. We build a bamboo box for a vegetable garden trellis. We construct a simple and inexpensive raised planting bed with lumber and a special new style of concrete block. And we travel to Kingston, Oklahoma, where the incomparable Leon Sloan takes us through the process of constructing one of his wicking containers from recycled materials. Salsa is one of our favorite condiments and homemade salsa is even better. After all, we can control the texture of it, the flavor of it, and most importantly, the heat of it. But in addition to being able to make homemade salsa with the produce that you might buy at the grocery store, you can even control it even further if you were to buy the plants that you might use in order to grow that produce yourself. So today we're going to build or create a salsa garden. And it's pretty simple. All you need to do is plant a tomato plant, a pepper plant, and some cilantro. Now, if you have onions, you might want to think about using those onions, but if you didn't plant onions, you can also use some onion chives just to get that flavor in there. So we're going to start out by planting our tomato because this is going to be the biggest plant that we put in there. I would recommend maybe looking at finding a uh, determinate tomato and maybe even one that's a patio type tomato that's going to stay relatively small if you're doing it in a container. Now, of course, you can plant these same sort of plants just in your garden and harvest them and use those to make salsa as well. But here we just have a traditional kind of saucer container, nothing fancy about it. You do want to make sure there's a drainage hole in it so that it does drain. I would recommend that the bigger the container, the less you'll have to water it once it's established. So we've got our tomato plant here. You can see it's got some nice roots on it. If you see a lot of roots that are circling, you're going to want to tease those a little bit so that that allows those roots to go out into the soil once it's planted. Now the thing about planting a tomato, and this is unique to tomatoes, is that you can actually plant them deeper than what you would plant other plants. Traditionally we say let's plant it at the soil line that it was planted at in the pot, but with tomatoes you can actually take off those lower stems and plant them even deeper. This is just going to prevent it from blowing over and it's going to allow it to develop a bigger root system in that pot. So your arrangement on making a salsa container garden might vary. I've kind of put my uh, tomato a little bit to the center but off to one side as well um, because over here I'm going to plant my pepper plant. Now this is a jalapeno hot jalapeno plant and I'm just going to squeeze that container to ch and I let it just fall out onto my hand. I don't pull it because if I break the stem then I've kind of killed that plant. So we just let it fall out onto your hand. Again we have some circling roots that we're going to tease apart there and then we're going to plant this in that soil. Now with peppers you want to maintain that soil line. You don't want to bury it any deeper so make sure that it's going in at the same depth. So we've got our tomato, we've got our pepper, now we're just going to fill in with our cilantro. And we have here our traditional cilantro, it's the flat leaf, um, it looks like flat leaf parsley a little bit, but it definitely smells and tastes like cilantro. Um, some people don't want this in their salsa, so again by doing this at home you can choose whether you want to add it or not to your garden. We also have a different type of cilantro here that I want to show. This is called confetti cilantro and it just has a little bit more of a, a 
cut leaf to it, fern-like leaf to it. And I'm a little bit curious about growing this. I would imagine that when you're going to make your salsa, it's sort of chopped up more finely for you already straight out of the garden. Plus the texture is just gonna be really nice in this uh, pot. So you can see it's got some good roots on it there. We're just gonna kind of break those apart and plant that in the side here. So again, if you didn't plant onions in February, you might add that onion flavor by getting some onion chives. Again, it's got a nice uh, fine foliage to it to add some contrast to the broad foliage of the pepper and the tomato. We've got some good roots in here. So we're just gonna put that in our pot. Now, you notice when I started, I had this probably two thirds of the way full of soil. I planted the tomato, but these others, I've kind of just left them exposed a little bit. So at this point, I'm gonna go in and fill with some more potting soil around those plants um, to bring that soil line up. So here you can see it's a nice, easy container garden, one that you could put on your patio or a great way to introduce gardening to kids or to yourself if you're starting out. Plus, you're going to get an edible product at the end of it. Now that we've got it all planted, again, we only planted our tomato a little bit deeper. The rest are buried at the same height that they were in the container. You can see we've left a little bit of a lip on the container between that and the soil line, and that's so that we can water it without it washing away. We're prepping our vegetable garden for our warm season vegetables that will soon be going in the ground. And one thing that you can do in preparation before you start planting those tomatoes is go ahead and build a tomato cage. Now often you'll see those little three foot metal cages that we pretty much know that your tomatoes will quickly grow out of those. So go ahead and build something that's going to be sturdy and really hold up to those sizable plants, especially if they're indeterminate tomatoes and some of the larger varieties. What we've done today is we've built a bamboo cage. You can easily find six to eight foot bamboo poles um, that allow you to really go into the ground to give you plenty of strength. You can see we've got a good amount of wind blowing out here today and even I built this to last. So I'm not a Boy Scout, I don't know how to tie all those special knots, but a simple slip knot around uh, one end of the bamboo will give you plenty of rope then to tie around and make this cage. So the first thing I took into account was the spacing of my bed here. And so I really wanted to be able to plant the tomatoes on one side of this bed. This bed is about five feet wide. So we're gonna spend about two and a half feet for this tomato cage. So you can see here, we've used one length of that pole to go along the distance of that bed. So go ahead and lay out one pole so you know exactly where to put your corner pieces. Also, when you're cutting your end pieces, a skill saw works really nice to give you a good smooth cut. Um, but if you don't have a skill saw or a circular saw, you can also just use a hand saw to make that cut. Bamboo cuts pretty easily without too much uh, effort there. A small heavy mallet will really work well to drive these bamboo stakes into the ground. Now, if you do find that you're hitting some harder soil, you might use a piece of rebarb or something to kind of pre-drill that hole a little bit. But this bamboo really holds up well to being hammered on. Um, it's pretty sturdy. You can see it's flexible in the wind that we have out here, but it's gonna hold our tomatoes really well. Now what we used was just a simple twine and what I found is the distance of about a yard, which if you go from the stretched out arm to your nose, you can yeah. see that that's about a yard, works really well to wrap around your bamboo. And if you also, um, if you are working near a node, you want to make sure to kind of go on the upper side of that node so that it helps stabilize that knot so it doesn't slip down the bamboo because there's a bit of a swollen area on that. I kind of like to leave a little tail on that slip knot because 
because those come in handy to tie it and fasten it even more later on. Now if you don't want to use some sort of twine, which I like because it looks natural, you can also use, I mean there's, there's a synthetic twine and then there's always the good old zip ties that work really well also. A lot of times you can see people have made their own tomato cages out of some hog wire or something like that. And you can see these work pretty well. A lot of times you'll still need to put a T-post in the ground to stabilize them. And you can see again, while they have some more height to them than those ones you might purchase, our bamboo are still significantly taller, giving you a little bit more volume and support for your tomatoes as they grow. The other thing that's really nice about the bamboo versus one of these cages is once you've built these, you've got these to store and they're kind of awkward, they're bulky, and you're going to need to take up a lot of room during your winter months to store these. This bamboo, you can use it from season to season. All you're going to do is need to untie this, cut the string or the zip tie, whichever you prefer, cut that and take these bamboo sticks apart and then you'll just have a smaller pile of sticks to store through the winter months. So we're going to be planting some tomatoes in here pretty soon and depending on which variety of tomato you want to use, we're looking at this spacing and probably going to be able to plant three or four tomato plants. And as they continue to grow up, we're going to use this simple stretchy tape um, to sort of tie them in here and give them some support. Now the important reason why we want to trellis our tomatoes is it allows that vegetation to be up off the ground, which will help with better airflow and prevent diseases from getting in there and funguses from getting in there and also more importantly allow us to harvest the bounty better. Now what we've got built here is just four corners with three levels to it. I think this is really going to work for us but if we find later on that we need to add a little bit more support there's no reason that we can't come back in and add another midpoint in here to give it a little more structural integrity. You can also add some more end pieces if you want to do that as well. It's really up to you and what you're wanting to grow and your particular environment that you're trying to grow in. Like many of you, we spent this spring revamping our vegetable garden. As you might remember, previously we had raised beds that were just really mounded soil, which is a great way to make a raised bed. It's very inexpensive as it doesn't require any materials. It just really, you need a rake and a shovel to continue to mound up that soil annually. And over the years, that really kind of became more of a problem to have to redo that. And so we wanted to look at something that was a, a little bit more of a permanent structure to keep that soil in those mounded uh, spaces. And so as we were investigating what we could do that was inexpensive still, um, but would hold the soil better, we went to our local hardware store and found a block that I wanna talk to you about here. This is called a planter wall block. And what's nice about this, this is kind of a new sort of concrete block that many of us hadn't seen before, um, but it looks like one of those you might use to set piers for a deck or something. But what's different about it is it has cutouts on the side so that you can slip your uh, two by four, two by six, whatever uh, size lumber into it. And so it really works really nicely here. Now you could stack these a little bit higher if you wanted to and what's nice is they're very adaptable to make whatever size raised bed you wanted to. Ours here are 2 by 12 um, but depending on your size um, that's what, how much lumber that you would need also. Now these blocks run about $3 and they are available at most big, big box uh, hardware stores. So you would need four to make a traditional raised bed like you see here. And what's nice too is sometimes when you're dealing with raised beds, it's often one side of that raised bed, the wood might rot out. And so it'll be as simple as uh, taking that piece out and then slipping a new board back in. Now keep in mind, depending on the dimensions that you build, you're gonna to have to fill that with soil. So you wanna be aware of that. The bigger the bed, the more soil you're gonna to have to find to fill that raised bed. Now in our situation here, we were in an existing vegetable garden, so we have pretty much eradicated all of the Bermuda grass in here, so we weren't too concerned about that. 
Now, if you're in a traditional backyard where you have Bermuda grass that's just kind of taken over the whole backyard and you're looking to install a new raised bed, something like this, you're going to want to deal with that Bermuda grass before you just put a raised bed on top of that um, Bermuda. And the reason why is that Bermuda is going to creep up into your vegetable garden in no time and create a headache for you as you go through the season. Now there's a couple of ways to work on removing that Bermuda grass. Um, a couple of those options would be, one, you could spray it with a weed killer such as, or a grass killer such as glyphosate. You can also use several layers of thick cardboard if you wanted to put that down. Now keep in mind the cardboard is not going to kill the Bermuda grass, so what it's going to do is block out the light and really suppress the growth of it. So it, as the Bermuda grass um, continues to grow underneath that cardboard and the cardboard gets moist and breaks down, that Bermuda grass is going to work its way up possibly into your vegetable bed. So keep that in mind, you're still going to need to be vigilant about that. Another option would be to put down some landscape fabric. Um, most of our vegetables, tomatoes, peppers, and things like that only need about six to eight inches of soil to grow in. So that uh, depth here of your lumber would provide enough soil um, for that root zone of your vegetable plants. The problem with the landscape material though is for something like potatoes, that plant is not going to be able to go down any deeper into your soil. So keep that in mind as well. Another option would be to use a sod cutter and actually cut out the dimensions of the raised bed, cut out that Bermuda grass and remove it. Now even though you've removed the top part of that Bermuda grass, I guarantee you there's still rhizomes that are in that uh, under layer of that soil which will work their way up. So really the best option if you're working with a Bermuda lawn and you're looking to add a raised bed like this is to use a combination of those um, depending on what your preferences are. And I would also recommend to do it at least maybe um, six inches to a foot outside of that raised bed because if the Bermuda grass comes up it's going to quickly creep over into your raised bed as well. Um, and also it's less to have to weed eat around. So keep all of that in mind as you're building one of these, but these are a simple way to build a raised bed in your backyard. Today we're here at Kingston, Oklahoma, and joining us is Leon Sloan with Leon's Greenhouses. And Leon, you've got a, a new take on an old concept, really. Can you share with us this idea of this container garden? Okay, well, we were looking a way to get rid of the excess plastic we have on this earth. You know, there's milk jugs, water jugs, and tea jugs that are floating down the rivers into the Gulf that's killing our mammals in the ocean. Yeah. And we want to stop that, so what we've done, we've taken these mineral tubs, this is a 20 gallon mineral tub that the cows have licked all the mineral out of, and then we take these, and we take our empty milk jugs, and our water jugs, and our tea jugs, and orange juice jugs, and put them <laughs> in the, and we put seven of them around the outside edge. Uh -huh. We've drilled holes in the bottom and in the top to, uh, make them where the whole water will come in the bottom and air go out the top. When the water recedes, then they'll suck air back in them. And so we use this away to give us a platform above the water level to keep the plants from drowning. And so, so having this in here, basically we're creating a self-watering uh, or a longer sustaining container garden that you don't have to water quite as often, right? That's right. We call it a self-wicking. You still have to put the water in okay, it. Okay, okay, self-wicking. You could even hook it up for, you know, to put a water line to it where it would float and keep it full all time all summer. Okay. That's just a little different step that we don't usually take for people. They just want to water these. They just have to water once a week or so. They can water it by hand in this pipe right here. Okay, so by having these containers, they're going to be full of water, completely full, or how, well, do, how do we control the level of the water? Because you have an excess 
water level hole right here that's about five or six inches up here and we'll have that much water in it and then you'll have this much air and then you'll have your soil above that. Okay. But there is about 15 to 20 percent of this soil that's touching the bottom of the tub around this inside jug right here. You see we put soil down around this and this is what wicks the water back up to the plant. So you're going to have these columns of soil between the containers. That's correct. Okay. All right, so and then the rest will be full of uh, soil, and obviously we have a good eight inches right. of root zone that those plants can grow now, in. Of potting soil, not garden dirt out of the garden, okay? Now then, with because of so many bottles of floating into the ocean and killing our mammals, now we've decided we want to hide these soda pop bottles, which are everywhere. So we take these soda pop bottles and we put them and fill these cracks up all the way around the outside. Now, yes, we had to put holes in the bottom and in the top of this so that we can stick it in there and water will come back and forth in your jugs. So we put one between every one of those. Okay. And we got rid of now, we've gotten rid of about uh, two, four, six, seven more soda pop bottles that's not going to go kill our mammals in the ocean. Now then we've got about 15 to 20 percent of our soil that's going down in these cracks that will touch the water and wick it back up to the plant. Uh -huh. and, you, and you have found that this ratio with this uh, amount of uh, columns of soil actually works well with the ratio of air and stuff? Correct. We've tried it with like 40-60 uh, ratio and it's too much water and it'll drown the plant. So we have to go on down to about 15 to 20 percent okay. soil touching the water. And tell, and tell me about this uh, pipe that's sticking now, out. What? This is just a, a one inch pipe that we cut on an angle to so when it sits on the bottom water can still run out of it. We cut the threads off of one of these jugs and just stuck it in there so the soil wouldn't fill the bottom of it up. Mm -hmm. And when you water, you put your water in this hole. But now, before you put your water in, we recommend putting a teaspoon of fertilizer to every gallon of water you put in here. Okay. So take your five gallon bucket, put your five teaspoons of fertilizer in it, and put your funnel in here and pour it in until it runs out your excess hole here. And then you know it's full and good for another week, 10 days. That's amazing. And, and really this out allows the water to get down to that root zone initially. You could water at the top of this as well. You just want to make sure it still flows out. Is that correct? That's correct. Now I will mention that if you're going to have this sitting outside and not in a high tunnel uh -huh. where we're getting all these excess rains in the spring, then you fill this full of potting soil instead of filling it level, you round it up in the middle where it'll be mounted and then you take a, a trash bag and you take and lay it over here, cut you a little X where this pipe is and push it down over it, tie your string around to hold your plastic down and then the excess rain will come off the barrel and not in your barrel. So you kind of created a, a small raised bed plasticulture That's garden right. for You're your right. vegetables. You are correct. Okay, all right. So now while these are very functional, some might not find them quite as aesthetically pleasing to put on your front porch if you're looking to put petunias or something like that. Um, is there some way that we can take this and retrofit it to be a more aesthetically pleasing container? Well, yes, I've been notified that these are not <laughs> appealing to the ladies in the front porch. So some of them take and paint these. Even though they come in different colors. Yeah. Oh, they do, <laughs> yes. But they still want them painted either a brown or a maroon or something right. like that to look more like the uh, pots. Uh -huh. So what we've done, we tell you just go, is this what you're going to yep, see right yep. here now? Look at here. We decided to go get a fancy pot. And I know there's a hole in and there. Right there it is. It's a plastic pot, mm -hmm. so it was easy to drill a hole through? Yes, it was. Okay. Once, I mean, now, there's no holes in the bottom. Mm -hmm. No holes in the bottom. It's strictly where it'll hold water. There was not a hole in that t uh, container when we purchased it. Just. So we drilled one hole five inches up. And then we took a, uh, just a, uh, uh, here's one of the old pots that somebody, you know, was growing in and the plant died in it because it, got holes in the bottom and they didn't keep it watered. So we just take that and turn it upside down in there. And you can see now you've eliminated about 75% of that soil touching the bottom. Of course, it's just. So how do you prevent, when you fill this with soil, this is replacing those milk bottles and plastic uh, containers. How do you keep the soil from going down into those okay, holes? Okay, we take a little piece of our garden, our, our uh, ground cover and just put it over those holes like that. Okay. and then fill it full of potting soil around 
and you've got the same thing as you've got over in that mineral tub as you have in this pretty container for the flowers and this the ladies are a lot more happy about this. <laughs> well, and of course, this is woven plastic, so putting just plastic wouldn't work because you want that That's air correct. movement through there. You want the air there. movement through there. You are correct. Okay, yes. excellent, excellent. Okay. All right, well, it sounds like a great way to allow yourself a little vacation time during the summer from your garden. Oh, it does. This will, this will take care of it while you're gone. Thanks for sharing this with us. You're Leo. certainly welcome. Next week it will be time to get out the saw and sharpen the pruners. There's lots of trimming to be done this spring and we'll have the how-to to do it all. Casey will prune the roses and brambles and Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food and Forestry, Urban Forester Mark Bays will take us through the tools and techniques of proper tree pruning. Until then, we wish you health and wellness and we'll see you next week for more Oklahoma Gardening. To find out more information about show topics, as well as recipes, videos, articles, fact sheets, and other resources, including a directory of local extension offices, be sure and visit our website, oklamagardening.okstate.edu. And we always have great information, answers to questions, photos, and gardening discussions on your favorite social media as well. Join in on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can find this entire show and other recent shows, as well as individual segments on our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. And tune in to our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel to watch segments from previous hosts. Oklahoma Gardening is produced by the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University. The Botanic Garden at OSU is home to our studio gardens and we encourage you to come visit this beautiful Stillwater Jewel. We would like to thank our generous underwriter, the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry. Additional support is also provided by Pond Pro Shop, Greenleaf Nursery and the Garden Debut Plants, the Oklahoma Horticultural Society, and the Tulsa Garden Club.